I don't know if going on vacation for you is as stressful as it is for me, <laughs> but it's usually fairly stressful, especially the last day. And actually, it's not really the last day, it's the last half hour, because I then realize all the things I forgot and I start throwing things in because I have to take care of all of the unresolved issues that I forgot to take care of. I'm reminded of my vacation issues whenever I read these last two parshas, what I said before the Torah service about the two parshas, Matot and Masay, is there's so much stuff crammed into it. It's almost as though that the Torah itself was saying, well, we didn't do this, we didn't do this. Oh, wait, we forgot to give the Levites some land in Israel. We forgot to say who's in charge of giving out the land. And, and oh, by the way, the daughters of Slavchad that last week, Moses, you, you, you gave an awful lot to, you can't give that to them. Everything's been thrown in. It's almost as though the Torah was just trying to fill all of the cracks that it had missed, which is odd because we've got a whole other book to go through in Deuteronomy. But it's not odd if you take it in context. In the year 626, according to the biblical text, roughly the year 626, under the reign of King Josiah, the Kohanim were doing something like spring cleaning of the Holy of Holies. And they found a scroll in the Holy of Holies and they took it to the prophetess Hulda. You all know Hulda, right? It's like we've never heard of her before. They took it to Hulda, and Hulda said, oh my God, that's not a quote, by the way, I'm, I'm embellishing it just a little. She said, oh my God, this is the lost book of Deuteronomy. We only have a couple of problems with that. One, we didn't know there was a lost book of Deuteronomy until that point. It's never mentioned in the biblical text that, oh, by the way, Moses came down with five books, but we lost one of them. And two, the book of Deuteronomy is substantially different in both content, style, grammar, and just about everything else you could name from the other four books. So as the theory goes, Either it was the lost book of Deuteronomy, depending on how traditional you are, or it was written at a different time and then brought to the children of Israel. We do know, according to the text, that on the basis of finding the book of Deuteronomy, King Josiah introduced what we call the Deuteronomic reforms, which was, oh my God, by the way, I'm embellishing that as well, <laughs> oh my God, we haven't been doing anything that the book of Deuteronomy has been telling us to do. We better start getting on the program. And on the basis of that, they changed just about everything that goes on in Israel. Putting that aside for the second, what it does mean is that whether it was a lost book or a quote unquote found book for hundreds of years, the Israelites felt or knew that these two parshas that we now read were the last parshas in the Torah. Which means that these are the parshas, you know, what happens at the end of a book? At the end of a book, the author throws in absolutely everything to resolve all the issues that have gone unresolved. So these actually were the endings of the four books of Moses. And that makes perfect sense because they then had to resolve, well, what do you do with the daughters of Slavchad? Who's going to get what land in Israel? Who's going to apportion it? What are we giving the Levites? Oh, and by the way, let's get rid of the Midianites. I hadn't mentioned that before, but let's get rid of them. And that's all to the side because the most important part of these two parshas is the beginning of Masay where they outline the triptych of the Israelites after they left Egypt until they get to the plains of Moab and are just about to enter the land of Israel. It makes perfect sense. At the end of the four books of Moses, the Israelites are ready to go in and it's important 
when you're moving forward to know where you've come from. Because you can't really appreciate or understand where you're going unless you know where you've been. That's true for a peeper, people, that's true for a culture, but it's so especially true for a person. We are very lucky living in Maryland. Now, by the way, as a Virginia resident, I'm not really sure I can say that without sounding somewhat traitorous, but we're very lucky to be in the Jewish community in this area because it's a very strong Jewish community and it's a community with a strong identity. So many of you may know that I spent a year in San Antonio and I learned a lot about Judaism in San Antonio. I learned much more about Judaism than I ever thought I would. The Southwest of the United States has a Jewish community like no other. And there were issues that came up on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, that I was unprepared for because I'd never seen anything like that before. And I didn't really understand the phrase, I could, I could say, you don't really know where you're going unless you know where you've come from. You don't really know who you are unless you know where you come from, until I went down to San Antonio. I had been there about three weeks, and a man comes into my office. He's in his 60s, he's a PhD in physics, which automatically got my respect, because I can spell physics, and that's about it. He had just retired from the armed forces. San Antonio has one of the largest bases for the army in the United States. And he came to me with a problem I had never had before. He said, I'd like to convert to Judaism. And I said, okay, but why? And he said, well, my mother died several years ago. And when she was in hospice, we were giving her her medication and we happened to roll up her sleeve. And on her sleeve was a tattooed number. I said, wait a minute, you're in your 60s. You'd never seen your mother you never seen your mother's tattooed number before? And he said, no, he said, it's actually a joke in the family, which is no matter how hot it got, she would wear short shorts, but always long sleeves. I said, so did you ask her about the number? And he said, yes. What did she say? She refused to answer. I said, well, was your father alive? Yes. Did you ask him? Yes. What did he say? He refused to answer. So I, I said, do you remember anything about the number? And he said, yeah. I said, he said, I didn't get a good look at it. I said, there was a letter at the very beginning of the tattoo. Do you remember what the letter was? He said, it was a B. And I said, okay, um, you're Jewish. Now, most people don't know, perhaps, that the only concentration camp that tattooed was Auschwitz. And they assigned non-Jews different letters. For instance, gypsies were the letter Z but Jews were A's and B's. I said, you're Jewish. And he started crying. He said, I'm 63 years old and I didn't know who I was until now. You don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And I would tell you that that was 
the least weird story I have from San Antonio. There are much odder ones. But that one was specific to this Parsha. What the Torah wants in this Parsha is for us to know where we've been so that we can understand and appreciate where we're going. And I find that to be true in all walks of life. Without a firm foundation of identity, we really don't know where we're going. And we're not really sure how to get there. And at this time of year, as we approach the high holidays, this is the time for us to affirm what our identity is and to embrace it. 